It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this um, session on inverting the legacies of balanced literacy. And boy, we've got a bit of work to do there. Um, and we're in good hands um, with Dr. Nathaniel Swain. Nate and I just worked out that we first met in 2013 when I was approached and asked to be part of his PhD supervision team and what a joy that was and it's a wonderful working and personal relationship that just gets better and better and next year we're going to be colleagues at La Trobe University because Nate's joining us for those who don't already know. So initial teacher education at La Trobe University, reading instruction, no pressure at, at all. <laughs> Um, so over to Nate uh, to talk us through this incredibly important um, topic and I was thinking this morning if there's a word to describe Nate, I think it's polymath um, and, uh, and I think your, your talents are uh, extremely diverse and uh, looking forward to hearing this presentation. Thank you so much Pam and I'll, um, I'll do a similar thing to read and I won't necessarily stay here, I'm going to wander a little bit because I've got my big stick. And I can use it in action, so I can't just be behind a lectern the whole time. So um, a very big welcome and thank you for having me. Um, lovely to meet you. I've, many of you I've actually know already through various social media exchanges and email exchanges. So if I don't get your, connect your name to your face, do forgive me. But it's been so lovely when people have come up and said hello. Um, so I'm a speech pathologist and a teacher by training. Um, I'm also a very passionate educator of all kinds and I've been doing teaching since a very young age as a dance teacher originally, and my original passion was performing art. So if I get a little bit too theatrical, just tell me to cut it back a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm very privileged to have two amazing children and um, my wonderful partner, Gabriella, and they're who I always think about when I'm doing these things and why we're so passionate about education for the next generation. Um, and here are my little characters in action um, there, which is very sweet, so Francesca and Raphael. Um, and uh, everyone sort of always says to me that I'm amazed you do all these different things and you've got all, everything's going on. And I, I, I often say I just try and do the best I can given the time that I've got. So I often have a lot of plates spinning and some of them do sometimes fall down. So do forgive me if I don't take a little while to get back to you sometimes when um, I am spinning too many plates. To take you through what we're talking about um, this afternoon, um, I really want to tell you about how we got here in terms of balanced literacy and the, the legacy that we've got in our schools, um, particularly in, in Victoria and Australia, but a lot of it generalises. And then look at some of what are those truisms that balanced literacy has left us with and, and how do we actually look to change them? Because it's, it's a big learning process for every teacher to suddenly throw out a lot of the things that they've thought to be true for such a long time. Um, and it's, in many ways, it's a complete flip, as we'll talk about. So what will, does it look like to then invert our approaches? I think that's one of the, the big things that um, I want to uh, emphasise and to show that it is a, almost a complete black, a backflip of, um, of way of thinking about teaching. And then how do you fit it all together in a literacy block or in, in the um, delivery of a literacy program across a year? So to begin with, um, I love going back to this. This is one of the original papers that were written up from Yetta and um, Kenneth Goodman um, for, based on a talk that they did back in 1979. And some of these ideas are still pervasive today, which I think it's really important to, to get to. So learning to read is as natural as learning to listen. And I know if you have had these conversations with your colleagues, they'll, they'll say stuff like that, that, oh no, it's, you just need to give them time and you know, exposure to books and an opportunity to just absorb it and then they'll just get it. They'll just become a reader or they'll become a writer or just let them experiment with writing and with, with, with uh, drawing and it'll just magically, they'll start writing sentences and it'll all just happen. So you know, that's, in some ways, that's where one of those main ideas come from. Um, learning to read is primarily about meaning making and not linguistic abstractions, which I think we've learnt today in many of the sessions that if you don't know what those abstractions are as a teacher, then you really set yourself up for failure when your students don't make those connections themselves. Um, and the best way to ensure that everyone becomes a proficient reader and writer is to actually teach them what those abstractions are. So how does all of the written code and the spoken um, oral language, how does it all intersect at a word level and a sentence level and a paragraph and a text level? Um, and those abstractions are actually the keys to unlocking all of that understanding. So, you know, quite the opposite. Another quote here, proficient reading is a process of integrating good old graphophonic, um, syntactic and semantic information, which I'll go into a bit later. So that's your three queuing method. 
Um, and then here's one that we'll come to a lot today, that reading should always be meaningful, contextualised and social. So that idea that if you try and take it away from a meaning-making process that you're sharing with students, then suddenly you're going to make it boring or uh, not meaningful or um, take away from students' natural ability to, to pick up ling um, literacy. Um, the, this idea of going from whole to part and building a sense of form and structure within their functional, meaningful experiences with language. That's why it's whole language, not parts of language. It's where that sort of term comes from. Um, and I'll, I'll unpack that as well later on. And then, uh, this is my favourite, Attem attempts to teach arbitrary skill sequences in reading is as pointless as teaching a child to listen. And there's a um, classic... Um, misunderstanding there about the difference between biologically primary and biologically secondary knowledge um, and also an, an underrating I think of, of how much we actually teach through social interaction ar around even things like listening and speaking. So um, you know it's, it's very it's quite the opposite in terms of teaching a skill sequence and as teachers we know that scopes and sequences are really really important and if you have an idea of that scope and the best way to sequence it that can actually make or break whether that literacy program and, you know, in the sense of a, a whole suite of curricula that you've got um, can actually um, work for your students. So here's the good old three queuing system. And if you haven't read this paper by Marilyn Yeager Adams, it's a really fantastic one. Um, it's, a, it's a chapter um, that you sort of have to dig up a little bit, but you can find it if you Google it. It'll come up as, as a PDF. And she did this amazing work where she tracked down um, where the three queuing came from. So if you didn't know about this, the idea is that you can get to the meaning of the word by looking at the semantic cues in terms of what is the, the picture saying or what's the, the rest of the story been about so far, the syntactic cues, so what's the sentence and what's the word that might be missing that makes sense or that sounds right in that sentence, and then the, finally the graphophonic cues in terms of what the actual letters are um, pointing to in terms of reading the word. Um, and then around the edge, sometimes this is here, sometimes it's not there in the diagram. It's the idea that understanding the whole context of the, the text or the conversation that you're having. And interestingly, Marilyn Yeager Adams talked about, my clicker's being a bit funny. Um, so on one read of this diagram, it actually makes sense with the scientific literature at the time. So I've got this little quote here. So, well, so that the meaning of text is constructed by the reader as jointly determined by its lexical, semantic and syntactic constraints had been a central theme of the reading literature in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Great example of like a very dense piece of um, text there. But to unpack that for you, when um, Marilyn Yeager Adams saw this in one of the, the PDs that she was giving where a, a teacher came up and drew this schematic on the board and said, how does this fit in with the three queuing system? And she was like, what's the three queuing system? She, she looked at it and thought, oh, this actually makes a lot of sense because it's about using different cues to piece together what the meaning of the, um, the text might be about. She's like, oh, I get what you're saying. And she went on to speak about it for another hour. But the, the look on the people's faces in the audience was one of, quite, of, of confusion and a little bit of antagonism. And she, for that hour, she was trying to figure out why that was the case. And um, it then came to light that the cues here are not intended to find out the meaning of the text. They're actually intended to figure out what the word is. So um, the problem with the three queuing system in many ways is that um, you're confusing, like using these cues with actually making sense of the text, with using these cues to try and guess what the word is. So um, the little girl liked to ride her, and there's a blank, and you think, oh, it starts, uh, you know, it, it, maybe it's horse, maybe it's pony. I'm looking at the picture, there's a horse or pony there. Now I'm gonna think about what makes sense in that sentence. Oh, okay, um, a noun would work syntactically. So maybe it's a noun like horse or pony. Um, then there's a P, so I'm going to, oh, so P, maybe it's pony. But that's actually one of the most inefficient ways, as we've covered today, um, of, of getting to what the, the word says. You just need to be able to read the word. Because maybe it doesn't say have anything to do with it. The girl loved to ride her spaceship, and there just is a, a pony for another reason, almost as like a, something to be ironic about what, what the sentence is about. So the, the best way to read is actually to read the words. Um, but this whole diagram, almost sums up what some of that, um, the difficulty is with teachers understanding how to teach decoding and, and how it's different to teaching the rest of the reading um, rope, if you like. Because they think that guessing the word from the picture or the sentence context is actually the best way to get at it. And there was this whole movement in the 70s where they said, we need to avoid using the phrase sounded out. And there was these things that were sent home very similar to the try and lion and skippy the frog and those um, cues that sort of come from this way of thinking that said the last thing you want to say is sounded out or the last thing you want to say is look at the word when in fact flip it 
It's the exact opposite. Look at the word. Look at what the letters say. Try and sound it out. Um, because using all these other cues is interesting for the meaning, but it's not going to necessarily help you decode the word. So that was one of the most interesting things that she realised, is that the participants were talking about it on a completely different level to what she was um, thinking. One of the reasons it's um, stayed around for so long, these ideas of whole language and then balanced literacy, is that it, um, written into it was the view that whole language shouldn't be questioned by anyone else by cl than classroom teachers. So they've repeated that no one but the classroom teacher has any right to intervene in the teaching of literacy, as surmised by Frank Smith. So I'll let you read this. And as you're finishing that off, just give me a sense of your hands if you've heard a version of this, um, this sort of idea sort of uh, emerge in a conversation with a colleague or with a principal or with a parent or it's like, oh, but, you know, no one should be interfering but the teacher or no one should make that decision but the teacher. So that's actually one of the things that was written into the Bible of, of whole language, if you like in that, um, that there shouldn't be external influences on the classroom. And that's one of the reasons why some of these ideas have really stuck and haven't been able to change. What has meant by all of these years of um, throwing out the understanding of the structures of language is that there's this massive professional knowledge gap now. So this is from that um, great paper by Stark and colleagues, including Pam, who's here this, um, this afternoon. Self-rated ability to teach phonemic awareness and phonics had no relationship with demonstrated knowledge in these areas. The teachers were most likely to rate their ability to teach skills, including spelling, phonics, comprehension, or vocabulary, as either moderate or very good. So they're good confidence. And this was despite most respondents demonstrating limited knowledge and stating that they did not feel confident answering questions about knowledge in these areas. So that um, knowledge gap of teachers is really big because they haven't been given the professional education that they need to prepare them for teaching this content. All of that arbitrary school sequences have been taken out of the curriculum of what teachers are taught in um, their initial teacher education and it doesn't feature in, except in places like this where we're trying to create a resurgence around that professional knowledge. And that's a really big problem. So what are some of these truisms then? And just um, as you're reading these things, I'd like you to think about, have you heard some of these arguments before? Have you heard these ways of thinking about balanced literacy before? So let's see. This is taken from a really... <laughs> Um, I shouldn't say dodgy. A, 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 a questionable conference presentation from a few years ago which tried to sum up the, the, how fantastic the Victorian Early Years Literacy Program was. And this is where, where we've gotten to in some ways. And it's a summary of a, th a whole lot of things. But um, it, you know, it, it basically brings it all together into what balanced literacy has got left. So placing meaning at the core of reading. So don't, don't worry about these sounds and these make, you know, barking at print. Don't, don't get them to think about syllables or sentences, all those nasty grammatical things. Like, just put meaning at the centre. That's what's really important. Recognise the interaction between reading and writing. Another one's less controversial, I think. Recognise the importance of context in reading. And it's more, context more important than the text, often, which is a, a bit problematic. Putting equal emphasis on the development of semantic, grammatical and graphophonical phonological knowledge. So that's the three queuing system again. Um, and that really means for the purpose of decoding the words, not necessarily for making sense of the text, which is where that belongs, that idea. Recognise the importance of students developing effective strategies for processing texts. So that really means like using those cues well um, and often not actually learning to decode and sound words out, which is what we should be doing. And providing instruction across a range of fictional and factual, factual text types. That one's less controversial. Promotes a balance of shared, guided and independent reading. Depends on how you define those things, whether that's a problematic or not. And bases instruction on assessment, effective assessment of students' needs and abilities. And this is one of the tricky ones in that I get lots of people coming back at me um, with curricula or ideas for resources that we, we make available to people because we really believe in the culture of sharing where they say that I can't use any of those because I need to teach at my students' point of need. And I need to um, base my next lesson based on what they've done in the previous lesson. So I can't, you know, any of these scopes and sequences won't work. Any of these ideas of a curriculum flow won't work because I need to basically create what I'm doing on Monday based on what happened on Friday. Um, and that's, a, I think, a real problem as well if you don't think that there should be an overarching picture of how learning develops over time. But that's um, essentially what balanced literacy tells us to do. So don't worry, this is a bit zoomed out. I'm going to zoom in. 
Um, I brought this with me. This is from the Literacy Continuum from Fonts Pinnell's expanded edition. And I was looking in it for evidence of stuff to do with decoding or, or, um, or you know, anything to do with phonics or phonemic awareness. And I was looking, looking, looking. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Adjust. <laughs> Let me just go over here, hold on. So this, there is solving words, but amongst that, it's all uh, monitoring and self-correcting, searching for and using information, adjusting meaning, summarising, maintaining fluency. When you actually look at this solving words part, very little of it is about phonics or decoding. It's a lot about like guessing what the word might be or like assuming what the word might be. All of that three queuing stuff in action. I'll just go to the next one. Then there's a whole lot in thinking beyond the text. It's all about predicting, about synthesizing, inferring, making connections, analyzing. So one of the biggest problems with the way this is conceptualized is there's just too much. For one, this is level K. So it's like at some point during year two or three, you're meant to have covered all of these different things at some point. So first of all, it's like it's too many things and there's no scope and sequence. It's not ordered. But also they've got a mix between things that are to do with decoding, a mix to do with things that are to do with comprehension. It's all just mixed in together. So it's very hard to know, like, what am I working on when and, and so forth. Um, and it, you'll also notice, which we'll get to in a little bit, that it's devoid of any content. So you're learning about all these comprehension strategies with any text, with any topic area, with, with any, it doesn't really matter what the topic is as long as you're doing some sort of predicting or synthesizing or monitoring. So then I did get to this. So I found this part, which is planning word work, which I really hate that term, after guided reading. And it says, use one to three minutes of active engagement in students' attention to letter sounds after guided reading. So they do their 10 or 15 minute, I don't know how long guided reading happens in schools, but 10 or 15 minutes of guided reading where it's a small group. At the end of that, just when they're ready to move on and because they're really tired, then do one to three minutes of phonics. But not phonics necessarily. Also some word analysis, like compound words, um, a little bit of morphology, a spelling rule, changing Y to I, incidentally, just as it comes up, you know, because you're talking about spelling, but you're not talking about spelling. Like so sorting words around, they love sorting words or ordering words in sentences, that's a big reading recovery thing. So it's like one to three minutes. Okay, I looked at this and thought, okay, this is years two and three. Surely in foundation, in prep, there's gonna be a bigger emphasis on this. One to three minutes, same. That's adequate. So it's exactly the same. And you look at the list of things, it's slightly simpler tasks, but um, it's still only one to three minutes. And I don't know how long, you know, how often guided reading happens in most schools. It may be once a week that they work with the teacher, or there might be less than that. I'm not sure how they structure things in some settings, but that's not a lot of instruction. And it's happening after the core of the instructions. It's right at the end, just when they're ready to move on to change the, to the next rotation. So their attention's already nearly gone, and you're going to use that to, to finally talk about the fact that there's CVC words and there's, um, you know, this is how you blend and, and so on and so forth. So it's all, it's all sort of um, diminished and, and disappeared. I think that's one of the big challenges. So here's another one. This is from the Literacy Teaching Toolkit. And one of the biggest problems I've got with this is... Oh, I'm going to break my computer, is that um, so, uh, you can work on things like phonics, vocabulary, fluency, comprehension, etc., as long as it's part of something else. So during modelling, close reading, focused mini lessons, deconstructing and annotating teaching and the learning cycle. But you must always be choosing one of these activities. You can't just teach phonics or phonemic awareness by itself. It always has to be in the context of something bigger. So modelled reading might be the best place to do it because the teacher's actually showing it. Shared reading, maybe not so much because some of the points the students are reading and some points you're reading. Um, there's also guided reading where you could do it, but remember it's only one to three minutes of that guided reading session that you're allowed to work on phonics. The rest of the time you have to be doing comprehension. Um, independent reading, I'm not sure how you embedded it within that because you're not actually instructing them at that point, they're practicing it by themselves, but all these other strategies as well, which are lovely and might work on some aspects of comprehension, but devoid of a scope and sequence and devoid of some content that you're trying to build, they don't often um, add a lot as well. So I've just got that there for your notes. So what that ends up looking like, this is, um, I've tried to capture what um, our school, Brandon Park Primary, did before the Science of Reading came in and, and sort of said how we spent our time. So this is one of the, the ways that we did it. So reading sessions tend to look like this. There was a five minute warm up, and then there was only a mini lesson, no maxi lessons, just mini, <laughs> because they can't listen for more than 10 minutes. 
and that would be about one comprehension strategy. So they might stay on the same comprehension strategy for a week or two weeks or sometimes half the term. They'd just be doing summarising every single day. And that's 10 minutes on that. And then they'd start their rotations where they do... Have anyone used like the, um, ca the cafe approach or literacy rotations, like daily five, seeing some nods? Yeah, hopefully we've moved on. Um, including some guided reading as well. So that's 10 minutes for 30 minutes, so three rotations, and then they have a five-minute reflection. And when I look at this, I think, where's, where's the phonics? Where's the, um, where's the topics as well? Like, where's the opportunity to develop content knowledge about different areas or look at stories in, in detail? It's like you've only got 10 minutes with them, and then they're going off to do completely different activities. So you've lost them in that sense of there's, there's very little time for instruction. Writing, very similar. So five minutes warm-up, which would usually be like a song or a, or a dance as well, which, as you know, I'm big fans of. But as long as the song and dance actually leads to learning, isn't just like, let's do the, the punctuation dance, which has nothing to do with this lesson. So then a mini lesson would be something like analysing a mentor text or talking about how genre works, nothing about sentences, nothing about grammar, nothing about the, the meaty parts that make up good writing. No, nope, because that's an arbitrary skill sequence. Um, and so 10 minutes on that, then independent writing for 30 minutes. And just like, off you go, see how you, see how you go. We're talking about narratives, write some narratives. Talking about persuasives, write some persuasives, see how you go. And then five minutes for reflection at the end. And you can see how many students would actually do, you know, half the class might do fine with this. They, you know, not fantastic, but they're going to write some text. They're going to make up for all that um, time because they're going to do more of it at home. Their parents are going to actually do a lot of phonics teaching behind your back. Um, and you just didn't realise. Or they, they pay for a tutor and, and they catch them up. But it's those other kids that we've been talking about today that, that do miss out, those, that, that don't have this time um, made up in other ways. Spelling, some, this is um, 20 minutes when you can. So it actually wasn't... <laughs> wasn't actually taught, at, and I say it hand on heart, wasn't taught at my school in a systematic way ever. So it's like 20 minutes, they'll do a little bit of words their way, which if anyone's done words their way, it's actually a cutting and pasting exercise. Like it's all the time is spent cutting words out. It's like 20 minutes of cutting and five minutes of sorting. And somehow that's meant to teach them the, you know, different ways of spelling the O-R, or, so or in different, O-R, A-U, et cetera, for the or sound. It's like, it's, yeah. It's a bit of a worry. So I, when I, my colleague helped me put this together, she was like, is this, what is this, why are you getting this information? What's it for? I was like, is this what not to do? I was like, no, so I want to show the history. I want to show where we've come from and how, how different it is. And that's, I'll show you what, what, what it looks like now, uh, now in, a, in a little while. But I tried to summarise it with this little diagram of, and the idea of why we, it is basically a bit upside down. So let me take you through this. So the most decontextualised and the most specific skills in balanced literacy classrooms are things like com comprehension strategies. Devoid of content, devoid of anything else. It's like, let's, let's work on summarising, let's work on inferring, let's work on visualising. There might also be some ideas about writing choices, of like what you choose as a writer, just randomly, let's write some openings or let, let, let's figure out some automatopoeia and then put that in there. Um, and there might be some word work in there, one to three minutes only. Um, so that's... And that's the things that are most decontextualised in that they're not put within something else. That's the focus of the lesson. Things down here are stuff that you do embedded in literature or embedded in other things. So guided reading, fluency, handwriting, and then phonics, phonemics, and words and spelling are put there because it has been neglected for many, many, many years. Um, and it, it is there in balanced literacy, but it's not the focus. And it's there, but it's, it's not what you're meant to think about first. It's meant to happen incidentally. Like, oh, we're writing a text... Um, we're making writing choices, we're writing te text about um, the three little pigs, they're doing a recount of what they remember of that story, and oh look, um, pig starts with a P. P great. I've done phonics. <laughs> <laughs> and um, don't, um, don't get me wrong, like, you know, sometimes it's done better than others, but I've seen examples of colleagues of mine who've, who've published in this area as well, who said that, you know, to get them to really understand phonics, they really need to do something real with it so that, you know, they, they do like the language experience approach where, you know, let's, um, we want to work on P as in P, but she'll say P because she doesn't understand about <laughs> phonological awareness. <laughs> I didn't bring that up at the time. I was really restrained. Um, so we're going to do a whole lesson on pancakes. We're, we're going to make the pancakes. We're going to talk about pancakes. We're going to make, the, and we're going to say P pancake, P pancake. Kid you not, this is what the lesson was. P pancake, we're making pancakes. Meanwhile, there's flour and milk and everything's going everywhere. Kids aren't knowing what P for pancake is. They're just interested in getting to the product. Also starts with P, but... Um, at the end, 
And then at the end, they're meant to then write about it. So the language experience is what you talk about it, you do it, and then you write about it at the end. And then somehow through that, they're meant to learn that P makes a P sound. Kid you not, first lesson of foundation this year, everyone learnt at P day one. And no, no longer than 10 minutes. It's like, this is S, S, A, P, T. That's it. You don't need a, a song and dance, literally, of, of pancake recipes to learn that P makes a P sound. You just need one exposure, and then another exposure the next day, and then the next day, a week, they've got it. And that, that's the first ones they learn because they can then start making some CVC words. So that's where it's like, it is upside down. If you're putting it there at the, as an afterthought of like, oh, I'm going to embed this somewhere in my lesson because really my focus is on summarising or on the choices that writers make, then you, you're going to miss out on an opportunity to teach something really concrete, really simple, just explicitly and just be done with it. And I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit further. So how do we go about inverting our approaches then if that's, if that's what we're left with at the moment? So some, so and this is the bit that some people might have a, you know, a problem with in, in social media and so on, but some reading and writing skills are actually just best taught um, explicitly and often in isolation. Like there's no reason to create a song and dance for P makes a P sound. It doesn't need it. It's just P makes a P sound. And this is how you write it. This is how you say it. And this is how I put into a word. P, at, pat, everyone do it with me, etc. So it, it makes sense to do that in isolation. So... Scopes and sequences can actually help you a lot to make a coherent and cohesive curriculum so that you know what you should be working on when, what, you know, what's necessary to understand it from the beginning to the end, um, what sounds are better to learn before others. You're not going to learn digraphs before you learn the single codes. It's just it's nonsensical if you want to get some basic proficiency with decoding and encoding. Building knowledge is really key. So I hinted at it a little bit, but I'll, I'll get back to it soon. Um, you can't actually build those comprehension strategies that we talked about uh, devoid of knowledge. Like you can't say, I'm going to generically improve your summarization skills. It just doesn't work. If I give you a, a paper on, I always use this example, I don't know why, rheumatoid arthritis, and I uh, get you to, ask, uh, to create an executive summary, unless you have some experience as a rheumatolo uh, rheumatologist, is that right? I just made that up. That might be the right term. Um, Morphology is helpful, hey? Um, then unless you're a rheumatologist, you're not necessarily going to be able to write a cohesive summary. You might get some key ideas, you might draw upon some, some second, uh, secondary level science, but you, that generic um, summarisation skill doesn't really exist. It, it's always in the context of the knowledge in which you're summarising. So that's why building knowledge should also, also be thought of in a really different way. Um, and teaching comprehension strategies is useful, don't get me wrong. I want my students to be able to predict and to make summaries and to um, you know, infer, obviously, as we've talked about a lot today with, with Pam's talk about how important inference is in oral and written language, but it's actually only a small amount of instruction is, is beneficial or has that effect. Most of the studies have gone, gone no longer than six weeks. So six weeks on comprehension strategies is enough for them to start using those metacognitive processes, not six years of primary school education working your way through all of the comprehension strategies. It's just not necessary. What is necessary is building that knowledge and as a precursor, building that decoding proficiency as well. So that's where this sort of flip came from um, in trying to figure out why everything feels like it's upside down. We just need to completely flip it. So instead of at the bottom, let's actually teach the most decontextualised um, and most specific skills like this. So handwriting, phonics and phonemic awareness, spelling, including morphology as well, um, fluency and sentence construction to some extent. You can do it without thinking about content to some extent and then put it within content later. But you want to develop these things just because they're good to develop, not because they're part of a guided reading lesson or because you've, you've done some um, a reading on that topic or there's a book that matches, just because. You just need to know this stuff if you want to become a proficient reader and writer. And that, that's a good thing to focus on that. And it might feel like it's out of context or that's an arbitrary skill sequence, as Goodman likes to talk about it. But if you learn these things, suddenly it's going to come into real fruition when these, this sand drops to here and we actually need to start using that as fuel for the next part. So the more contextualised and the more embedded things are things like, I put vocabulary there, so to some extent you could do some of it decontextualised, but really if you map it to content and map it to things they're learning about in a wider range of knowledge, like it's going to stick a lot better. Um, paragraph construction is going to work a lot better if you're writing about things that you know and about things that you're learning about and you can get bang for your buck because you're reading to learn and you're writing to learn at the same time. Content knowledge, obviously, don't learn arbitrary lists of facts. 
that doesn't work. You need to build up student schemas and have a really clear idea of what um, you're trying to get them to understand and the big picture and how it all fits together. Then text composition and then finally comprehension strategies. Yes, get them predicting and inferring and summarising, but do it about content that they know something about. And, and use those skills with a, a wider piece of work that you've done on a particular aspect of history or geography or science or literature. Is everyone still with me? All right, cool. I went to read slide thing. I was like, oh, my slides are not as clear as they should be. But <laughs> I've tried my best. I really have tried. Uh, and I'm, what I'm saying is it's not about back to basics. Like, it's, it's really not about that. It's about getting the foundations right so that you can actually move on and just use that as a foundation. It's, like, it's getting beyond the basics. Why am I worrying about phonics and handwriting in a year six class when I'm trying to teach them about medieval history. Like, what, I shouldn't have to think about, you know, those basic foundational skills that should already be embedded by that time at that point. But if you've left it so late and you haven't been building those foundations early, then you're still going to have year sixes who are struggling to get the P and the B around the right way. Um, and that's distracting. It takes away from their working memory. So it's really about beyond the basics. It's not back to basics. It's about get the foundations right and then Forget about them. That's the whole point. So they become part of your repertoire and they don't inter interrupt your, your cognitive load. So, it, you know, I'll just touch this quickly because it sort of leads into that idea about um, knowledge. So if you think about... Um, Pam talked about the situation model. Another name for it is the tripartite model of text representation. You want to think about the, the text is something that we want to access. In order to read the text, you need to understand the surface code, which is decoding the words and understanding what the words mean. If you can't do those two things, you can't even take any information off the page. Once you've got that, you need to build something called the text base, which is how the sentences link together. And those ideas of you know, pronoun reference and things where it's like this he refers back to that person that was introduced before. And you know, catastrophic is a synonym for terrible. So really, we're talking about the same concept there between the sentences. You need to, to, to build that in order to then create a mental model, which is like a version of what you've just read or what you've just learnt about in your head that you can then refer back to. So then when the text is gone, you've got something to actually ask yourself questions. You know when you do comprehension questions after a reading? What they're referring back to is their mental model. But this mental model, what do I remember about the text, doesn't just get built from the text. As, I keep referring back to Pam because she's right there, but as Pam talked about, it comes from your knowledge, what your schema is. And I've represented it here with a wardrobe. Because in many ways, if you don't, if you don't have a well-produced schema, a way of organising that knowledge, a lot of these facts represented here by clothing will not have anywhere to go. So I'll be like, uh, frogs are amphibians. What's an amphibian? Um, frogs live in uh, wetlands. What's a wetland? And so you've got amphibian, wetland. I don't have anywhere to put that. So like a really disorganised bedroom, it just goes on the floor. And so over time, some facts might get accumulated, but eventually you're going to have to clean up those clothes because you can't access any of them and you don't know what's there. So building up your schema or your background knowledge is really about having a better way of organising information as you encounter it. And um, that's why you can't be a good predictor or a summariser about a piece of information you know nothing about. Because you have to have something in here um, in order to make sense of what you're reading and in order to remember what you're reading. So over time, those schemas get built up. Um, and they get more um, elaborate. So if reading comprehension is like that, then it's really about the net effect of all of these constructs that I've been hinting at today. So it's, it's decoding, it's sentence level um, uh, understanding, so grammar, it's, but it's also background knowledge, it's vocabulary, and it's about whole, whole, how all those things come back together. So how would you then improve it? I'll show you what not to do. So imagine this is like the stage of your lesson. I'm going to say this lesson is about the comprehension strategy of inferring. I'm going to do that for three weeks. It's all about inferring. And in the background, yeah, the kids are going to have some knowledge and some language that's been developed there. There's some vocab and, you know, one, one day we're talking about dolphins. The next day we're talking about um, wetlands again. Then the, the next day we're talking about, um, you know, uh, why you should wear school uniforms, etc. It, it just changes every day, but we're inferring every single day, and that's the important thing. What we really need to do is completely flip that. Put the knowledge and the language at the front. We're doing a whole unit on 
um, you know, Australian uh, or Vic Victorian uh, train networks and how they were put together and the, why there was different gauges between the states and the fact that Victoria's was different to the, there. And yes, there's going to be lots of comprehension strategies going on to understand those texts. You need to be able to summarise and infer and make predictions, but it's not the focus of the lesson. I'm not giving you a lesson on, on summarising or predicting or inferring. I'm giving you a lesson about trains. And you're going to remember that a hell of a lot better than you would have if I made it about something else, about, about one of these comprehension strategies. So that's really what, what, what I'm trying to get at there in terms of that's the other part of the flip. And that's where the idea of a knowledge-rich curriculum comes in, in that you can't teach really good reading comprehension unless you build their knowledge in different areas. So history, geography, literature, science, etc. Um, and there's heaps to talk about there, but I just have to sort of hint at it. So coming back to here, um, this, it's, it's represented as an hourglass mainly because I want you know, the idea of flipping, is that you're putting a different priority at the top and you're embedding different things underneath. Um, and if you're, if you're trying to build some of these things incidentally, which is what balanced literacy says to do, then it's going to make your job a whole, hell of a lot harder than if you were actually making this the focus of particular lessons and then building these ones in much more rich and long sort of ways. So whole units or whole weeks on these topics and, and then practicing paragraphs while you do it and practicing how to compose text while you do it and practicing comprehension strategies while you do it. That's what really makes sense to embed. Um, so we're actually, I tried to conceptualize how this inversion is happening. It's sort of happening in, in a variety of different ways. One of them is time allocations. So in the early days, we want to put more time into those skill sequences. They're going to have bang for our buck later. So make sure you spend enough time on phonemic awareness and phonics and, um, you know, handwriting especially and, and, and those really important skills that are going to be barriers later on. So putting that time in early. But eventually, I shouldn't have to spend any time on phonics later on. If I've really got everyone in my class where they need to be, phonics should just be an automatic thing that they can use as a skill and a, a tool. Um, it's also about, uh, about the weight, so how much emphasis I put on different things. So, for instance, phonemic awareness, there's only five minutes a day that we work on that in our, um, or sometimes three minutes a day at Brandon Park. But if people aren't getting it, we really, you know, red flags go up because we expect all the students in our class to get really good at segmenting and blending and then eventually deleting and, and manipulating sounds. And if they're not, they go straight to intervention. It's one of those things that we really get on top of. And we've got kids in foundation that are getting intervention, phonemic awareness and, and phonics like straight away. So we're like, if that's not in place, then it's going to stop all of these other things. So it's yes, it's three minutes of every day, but there's a huge amount of a big red flag around it. It's so important, especially in the early days. And then it's that idea of like foregrounding and backgrounding and embedding. Which things are you going to put at the front of the lesson? Which things are more incidental at the back? Which things can you embed versus which things should you actually bring to the front and do explicitly? Because one of the problems with balanced literacy is that they're saying that you can explicitly teach phonics in the context of something else. So they're saying it's explicit and they're not afraid of that word anymore, but they, they, <laughs> they used to be. <laughs> And they'll even say things like systematic. Yes, it should be systematic. You should, you, each sound will eventually get ticked off by the end of year six. You know, <laughs> one letter for every week, etc. cetera. But um, the, the problem they have with it is, is that putting it at the front of the lesson. And we had this big argument about whether explicit teaching was its own practice, like whether you can actually just do a lesson using explicit teaching. And they're like, no, 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 no. It has to be either shared reading or modelled reading or guided reading or independent reading. It can't be by itself, like explicit teaching by itself, just it wouldn't make sense, the kids wouldn't understand it, it's, um, it you've got to go whole part whole, you can't just go the parts. And that I, when I looked at the Goodman research and I looked at balanced literacy and where it's come from with whole language, it's, uh, it all makes sense. It's, it, you've absorbed what they've said back in 1968 and, and the iterations thereafter and you're just spurting it back to me and you think you believe it because that's what you've been taught and because that's what you've based your whole career around. But that's why it's a complete flip. It's like, yes, you can teach it in an in a explicit way by itself without something else happening. In fact, it's the best way to teach it because then every student gets to learn it and doesn't have to incidentally pick it up. Um, whereas, you know, um, comprehension strategies, you, you can pick it up. You can, there's a little bit of explicit teaching that might work, six weeks maximum, but the rest of the time you can actually do it in context. Like, read a text together, model how you might summarise, model how you might predict, and kids will basically get it because there's an element of that which is biologically primary, of listening to something and making sense of it. And it's, it's to do with that oral language that's really underpinning all of that. As long as you have the knowledge as well of what you're talking about. It's not just a random topic. 
So, and that's the, the real flip between the typical focus to um, what I'm proposing as, as how we should think about where the emphasis and the weight should be. Um, and these slides I'll make available as well if you want to, if you don't have to worry about um, snapping if you don't want to. So then just in the last 15 minutes, like how do we try and fit this all together? So if that's the change in, in what we're doing, how can, we, how can we fit it all together into a way that makes sense? There's those key reading and writing skills that are actually best taught explicitly and often in isolation. That's the top half of the hourglass. Something that you might consider having a look at is the resource that my colleague Shane Pearson is putting together, which is a freely available um, word reading and spelling curriculum from F to 6. Um, and free, will, will eventually be complete with every single lesson for every single day of the year accounted for and is ready to teach. Um, and basically does all of these things that a good re word reading and spelling curricula does. So there's word reading and spelling together at the same time. There's a systematic approach to phonics um, with Phonemic Awareness Incorporated. There's explicit instruction with gradual lease. So that, you, know, you build things up very, with lots of lots of support and then it's faded over time. There's daily review and retrieval practice built in. So you introduce it once, but then it comes back the next week and then it comes back the next month. And some of my students in foundation might not have gotten it completely in the first iteration, but by the, the second exposure, most of them have it. And by the third exposure, nearly everyone has it. So my kids that I were worried about in terms of are they at risk for dyslexia at the start of the year, they're now spelling CCCVC words. And so my, my students wrote um, strap or something on the board. And I was like, oh, how, did, who came and who did that with you? And she was, oh, I did it. I was like, oh, like you've, you've just heard every single sound before the vowel there and you've represented it correctly with every single code that you've been taught. And she was one who was writing right to left and was you know, getting all of the letters reversed and wasn't hearing all the sounds. And you know, it is possible once you've got that retrieval practice and that opportunity to review that kids will get there with that consolidation. And she's had a little bit of extra intervention as well. Regular formative assessment is part of it as well. There's also a focus on orthographic patterns, not just random lists of words to memorize, which we know we shouldn't just do arbitrary sort of lists. You know, and you should have a good scope and sequence, but it's not about random lists of words that they've got a particular pattern that you're trying to teach and it's a comprehensive structured um, scope and sequence. To, sh to show you, FORM stands for phonology, orthography, morphology, etymology, and semantics. Um, and it does semantics in the form of some explicit vocabulary teaching. And by the time you get to year three, the focus moves away from phonology and orthography mainly into morphology. So you learn about how to spell even more interesting words and the meanings of those words by learning lots and lots and lots of prefixes and suffixes and root words, which have sort of been introduced back here, the prefixes and suffixes, but not for the purpose of writing yet. So it, it's amazing what he's done and the fact that it's freely available, I think is just a really exciting sign of where we're headed in terms of a profession where we do value sharing and we value high quality curriculum that everyone should get access to. So I encourage you to look at it. By the end of the year and by the start of next year, there should almost be everything up that's being created um, and being tested as it's, as it's put out. So to show you the time allocation, you know, if you remember back to the, the oh, before you look at it, um, remember back to the, um, the discussion about how the reading block looked in the balanced literacy version. This is what the um, spelling part, which was spelling when you can. This is now every single day what we do. So three minutes of phonemic awareness, 10 minutes of handwriting. And it's amazing how we've got just a fortnightly cycle of all the letters. Um, capital and lowercase, and it's amazing how you just do the same fortnightly cycle however many times all the way through the year and how it just starts to click for them. And they've got that explicit practice and some of them might only be doing the first two letters on the slide for the first week, but the next fortnight they've been able to do all four. Now we've had to start putting sentences on there because they're just too fast. They go F, 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 beautifully formed. You're like, okay, I need to give you something else because it's not gonna, it takes less than 10 minutes. Then there's the decoding and spelling part, which is um, 10 minutes of review. So they review things from the previous month, um, week and term. And there's um, irregular words, um, which we call weird words in the program, which are meant to give them access to words they're gonna need for reading and spelling that haven't fit the sequence that's been done so far in terms of spelling patterns. So really important for our wacky language. Um, but then also 17 minutes on the new spelling lesson. So initially this was like just different consonants and different vowels and until all of the single codes or single graphs were introduced. Now we're up to, um, uh, we, we did a whole lot of work on CCVC words um, and lots of consonants and lots of consonants before and after the vowel. And now we're, we actually started long vowels with them halfway through term three, because they're ready for it. So we started with A and A and E and E and OR, and they're ready because they've already mastered CCVC, even though it's halfway through foundation. It's, it's amazing how quick they can do it. Um, and 
Then we've got 10 minutes of reading fluency where they work in a pair um, and they read together side by side and you pair people deliberately so there's a little bit of difference and you alternate so whoever's the slightly advantaged peer gets to become the, the less advantaged peer to, to listen to more fluent reading than themselves and you sort of mix the groups around. And then we've got 10 minutes of vocab every day where we get things from our um, topics that we're covering in terms of we did the, the unit on farms, we did the unit on plants, we've done some things on fables and stories, we get vocab from there. We also just get generic, like um, very high leverage tier two vocabulary at different levels as well. Um, and then also some prefix and suffixes, which my students in foundation absolutely love. They're like, that's a plural S. Like they just get so excited about seeing those little endings and like, that's past tense ED. And like, they just, they love it. Now that they see these little pieces, they're starting to analyze the, the words that they're, um, they're, they're, they're encountering in their reading and their spelling, which is incredible. Phonemic awareness happens every day. We've just got a resource that's very similar to like Hegarty and things like that. It's just put together very simply. So it takes three minutes every day. And then the, the, the spelling and decoding slides look a little bit like this. So they read these particular codes and they learn what each of these are using flashcards initially and then um, reading them off the slide. And they, they're meant to come up one at a time. The animations are just taken off. So read, don't um, criticize me for that. So it's meant to come up one at a time. And the same for the decoding. One word comes up each time and they're practicing. These are um, CVC or CVCC words. And they're just practicing decoding them um, one at a time as well. And then they get to spell those words on their whiteboards and then spell those words in their books. Um, and it's always linked to reading and spelling. They start getting into um, prefixes and suffixes in the later years, and then by year three, their um, their slides on spelling actually look a lot like this. So they get introduced to different um, prefixes and suffixes and, and root words, and then they have opportunities to learn the meanings behind these words and the best way to spell them. So. Um, it, you know, it starts off very small, but it, it builds, and suddenly we've got students able to easily spell a word like um, recondensation or something like that because they know all the parts. They know re, they know con, they know de, seish, un. It's, it, you know, it becomes really simple for them because you've given them all the parts. Um, and that morphological awareness that you get as a bonus is just so helpful for vocab and for you know understanding novel words when they come across them in text. So then on the other side. If you think that's the top of the hourglass, there's all of these other things at the bottom which are meant to be more contextualised, more embedded in content and literature. And this is probably the harder part to get right. If you've started a science of reading journey, you probably started with all the handwriting and the phonics and the, ha and the phonemic awareness and you know, to some extent some vocab and some morphology. But if you've, you've continued with that journey, you might have started jumping on some of these things. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. And I'll just give you a little sample of this because I do need to finish um, rather soon. But this is how we've conceptualised it in terms of our, our new reading um, sessions are called Read to Learn, and this is really about building knowledge and about using comprehension strategies in the context of understanding interesting texts about topics that they need to learn. Um, and then Write to Learn are our approaches to, to basically take what the writing revolution does and link it in with the content that we're teaching, as well as a little bit from, say, William Van Cleve's um, Writing Matters and, and the syntax stuff as well, which we love. Because we love syntax, don't we, Pam? <laughs> yep. And um, so this is now the allocation for the reading block. You know, you remember back it was like a, ten minute, a five minute warm up and 10 minutes mini lesson, and then off you go to your groups. This is now what it looks like. So we might spend five to 10 minutes of review of previous content and um, like slides that we've read about particular areas. I'll give you these slides as well if you don't want to have to take pictures of them. Then we've got um, activating prior knowledge and the learning goals, very brief, very quick. Then we spend about 20 to 35, and that's a big range because it does depend on the kind of lesson. Sometimes it's a really meaty, texty le lesson. Sometimes it's a bit shorter and there's more application. But either uh, there is a, a significant amount of time reading together as a whole class, using teacher reading, um, choral reading, and sometimes the students really want to take turns to read aloud to their peers, so that just depends. But every three minutes or every four minutes, we are doing CFUs that are related to the text and that are usually practicing things like summarizing, inferring, um, finding the main idea and um, so on and so forth. So those CFUs are fantastic because it means that in between those short bouts of reading, students are getting an opportunity to show what they understand and the teacher gets information in real time to say, are my kids understanding what we're talking about? Or did I not explain that properly? Or do I need to go back and re-explain this concept or this vocabulary? Um, there's lots of knowledge building within there. So um, things like history and geography we're focused on to begin with, and most of our units are around that, but eventually we're moving to science and we'll do the same approach for literature as well, which is really exciting. Um, and then there's some activities and tasks built in there as well. There might be a geography task where they have to map the journey of the, the Vikings from 
you know, the, um, the north of the Nordic countries down to where they like to invade and so forth. There might be um, like a, a table that they need to fill in based on what they've read and they need to then um, sort of put, put things in the correct places, etc. So practicing those history, geography and eventually those science skills as well while you're doing this um, lesson. And then there's about 10 to 20 minutes on independent practice. So the majority of the class is really together. And the, re the reason for that is because the more time the students spend with the teacher, the more opportunity that those kids down the bottom or the kids at the top get that opportunity for extension and support. So the less time that they've just off by themselves um, without that direction, without that um, sense of building that independence, um, the better in, in our view. And that's the, it's sort of the EDI take on it as well. The writing lesson is a little bit similar. So we do things like five to 10 minutes of review. Um, and that might be like a sentence level strategy that we just get them to, to do something right at the end. Um, sorry, right at the start that they've learned in a previous lesson. We go through the activating prior knowledge and the learning goal. Then we spend about 20 to 30 minutes building their concept, their skill development, and the guided practice of the particular sentence or paragraph or text strategy that we're, that we're building. And depending on the lesson, that might look quite different. It might be quite fluid because the, the teacher's modeling how to write a introduction or they're modeling how they might turn a plan into something that's on the board, or they might be modeling how to write or plan a story. Other times it's quite structured in the sense of um, they're, you know, they're building how to, how to do a positives and they're showing what an positive is and how to um, come up with good positives and the students get opportunities to practice on their whiteboards to show their understanding of, of how to build a positives um, initially as well. Then 10 to 15 minutes of independent, um, and like I said, there might be sessions that you get to where it's like, oh, you know, the lesson's not really there today because now that we've got all these plans, students are going to spend the whole lesson writing their, their, their um, piece. So that does still happen, don't get me wrong, but most of the time the, the students are supported and given that instruction in those things that really, really matter. Um, and often we're getting, them, we're getting them to write about the things that they've learnt about in Read to Learn. So the content that, that they're coming across is what they've already been exposed to in their Read to Learn lessons. So to tell you a little bit about Read to Learn and why, you know, what it's like and how it's different and, and how we're trying to get that hourglass to really work. Um, and I've got other presentations on this if you wanted to check out on the Think Forward website. There's, there's heaps of, of things about this and we'll have another session in the ne next few weeks, weeks to try and recruit a few more people who might want to make these units with us. But it's the idea of bringing a knowledge-rich curriculum to life. Um, it's modelling and facilitating comprehension of complex text. So these texts are deliberately not very simple, like they're at grade level or slightly above grade level, even for those students who are having difficulty, because with the teacher there with them and with their peers alongside them, they can still access and make sense of these texts. And that's really important not to hold them back from what they learn about, because they're not necessarily where you, where you want them to be. Um, so it is deliberately complex, and the, the teacher's role is to guide them to, to manage that text. There's um, vocab instruction embedded as well. Um, and there's history, geography, and civic skills embedded as well. And eventually that'll be science and literature, literary sort of skills also, which we haven't gotten to just yet in this format. It's about building depth and breadth of content knowledge. Um, and really you can, you can see how that um, maps when you, you follow some of the, the scopes and sequences. And I was very fortunate to have this amazing work that Brad Newen did at, at Docklands to map the core knowledge curriculum and the Australian curriculum and, and try and find the differences and pieces between it. So a lot of what we've done has been based upon that original work. But you can see how the threads of different things in, in certain units then get followed through. So Indigenous Australians leads to early civilizations, which leads to the first Australians, which revisited again in year six in the colonial Australia. But um, with a good scope and sequence like this, we avoid situations like at my school where and everyone ended up teaching Tiddalik the frog every single year. So at some point in the year, every student will have read that same book um, story like seven times from foundation all the way to year six, just because the teachers liked it. It's like, oh, Tiddle, that's a great narrative. It's indigenous perspective, etc. Let's do it again. And so with a scope and sequence, you can actually say, well, they've done Tiddalik. Let's find another story that might be representative or let's find another aspect of indigenous literature that, that we could use. And that's where the scope and sequence is really handy and, and shouldn't just be left to the teacher to just come up with. I think that's where we need to work better as teams to really decide what we want to work on and what we want to cover. So you might be thinking, oh, there's lots of things in there about global history and there's lots of things about ancient history and global geography. Like, how does that fit in with what Australian curriculum requires? So what we've basically said is that with um, the scope and sequence that we're using, um, we actually satisfy the curriculum easily, but then go a lot deeper and a lot further. 
So our students understand the colonial history of um, Australia, which up until Federation is usually where it stops in terms of year six, um, because they've understood all of these other ancient civilizations and how they have developed. So they have an introduction to Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And there's a lot of similar, uh, similarities between those early civilizations before farming came along to how, say, some indigenous people um, lived before um, uh, contact with white people in terms of that you know, difference there. So um, that, that's where we actually go deeper and students come to that knowledge of what's required in the curriculum with a lot, a lot better understanding, a lot more background knowledge. Um, and I always get this question about what about inquiry? How does Read to Learn relate to inquiry? Because we're an inquiry based school. And basically we say that in Read to Learn students do inquire, but they inquire from a place of knowledge. They don't start their inquiry based project with absolutely no idea. And if I've got time, I'll, I'll give you this last anecdote. So the great example of this is year seven students. My wife is a teacher as well, but she's since left the profession. Um, and one of the things I think that put her over the edge was she did an um, a, a inquiry lesson on, because it's what she was required to do at the school, on ancient Rome. And it was um, the students go off and make their presentations and they, they look up things about ancient Rome that they like. And, you know, at one point, students are looking you know, at one group of students um, you can imagine the, the kind of groups I'm talking about who haven't received a lot of great instruction and they're struggling a little bit. They are creating a presentation with like six or seven different slides already produced about Roman cars. And so, you know, Ferrari and Alfa Romeo and all, all, all these cars because, you know, that's to do with Rome. And they haven't actually, they don't have any knowledge about ancient history and how that's, you know, cars, like that's preposterous to start looking at that when we're talking about ancient Rome. But that, that, that's what can happen when you inquire from a place of ignorance or a place of very little knowledge. Another example was um, a lesson on aqua ducks that my wife did and students are actually researching aqua ducks <laughs> as opposed to non-aqua ducks, which I don't think exist. <laughs> but you know, that's where that phonology and that orthography actually links to that understanding. So if you don't have the phonics and the phonemic awareness and the morphological awareness of knowing that's aqua, meaning water, and duct, meaning like a, a pipe, then you're not going to know what you're talking about. And, and that's going to be lost on you because you're thinking about ducks, aqueducts specifically, and everyone else is thinking about the, the miracle of Roman water sanitation. And so I think that's a really good example of how you can still get students inquiring. And um, I'll show you a preview, I think, if I've got it. You can still get students going off and doing things independently by themselves. And, but they're doing it after they've been given a great introduction to that knowledge. So this is one where they've been asked to do like a, a STEM activity where they have to go out and create their own river system. They've just completed a unit on rivers and every single group of four um, goes off and designs a river system. And they then annotate it with all the knowledge that they've built about um, how rivers work. And so they've annotated it with things like, you know, this is a tributary and there's every um, river starts at a mountain of some sort. That's the source. And then the mouth goes into the ocean. Sometimes there's estuaries. And they're using this language. They're writing sentences about it. And they're, they're still building their own projects in the sense of I'm going off and inquiring about what interests me. But they're doing it from a level playing field where it's not just the kids whose parents have taken them to the museum, you know, every fortnight for their whole life. Um, get to access this, that, you know, it's every single student has been given that foundation in knowledge, which is really why that, that knowledge and that language has to be at the front, not at the back of your lesson. So just to finish up, because I know that I've got like one minute left to do questions, um, Right to Learn I didn't get a chance to talk about, but we have got a little presentation about this on um, the Think Forward website. I just want to leave you with this um, image here. So really, um, this is what we're what we're battling in some ways in terms of conversations with our colleagues or conversations with leadership, they'll say things like, yeah, but reading is about meaning. And so if we're not doing comprehension strategies and putting meaning at the front, then you know, how are we going to be teaching it properly? Like you're spending all this time talking about sounds and getting them to do letters and it seems really boring. It's like, why, you know, why are you changing it so that it's like that? That's like how it was back in the past. And what I say to you is that you know, this is the foundations that we need that you should teach quickly and explicitly. And that then you can get to this meaty stuff so that um, even my foundation students are learning about aspects of, you know, the first Australians and they're learning about, um, you know, they're starting a unit on kings and queens and fairy tales, this, this term. And they're not reading those texts independently, but they're, they're engaging with that knowledge. And I know that because I've got this right, and I'm, I'm spending all this time across their primary schooling to get that right, then they will be able to assume that the reading and the writing skills that we're developing are there and ready 
to use to actually spend all of that power on, on those more important aspects of um, applying that knowledge and, and using that knowledge. Um, so I hope that gives you a little flavour of what I'm talking about. And there's a few resources that I can point you to if you're interested. I'll, I'll probably put like a summary of this talk up on my website. And you can always get in contact with me at any time, really, like Twitter, Facebook. I usually respond better if it's social media because I, I have a rule that if I read it, I have to respond to it because it doesn't stay in like an inbox unread. Um, so email, I'm a little bit slow on, but if you want something quickly, you can always Twitter or Facebook or something like that. And I love getting questions from people and, and having those conversations. So many of the people in the room who I haven't met before, but have worked with all year round through these conversations, um, it's, it's, it's been such a privilege. So if you ever have any questions and you want to reach out, I'm more than happy to help. So thank you. Nate, wow, <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of content in a short period of time. I resisted the urge to uh, tweet hashtag it's all crap anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> took a lot of self-discipline. Um, but um, time is going to prevent us from dealing with questions now, but Nate's really given you an open invitation. He's told you that he's available to you 24-7. Um, <laughs> when he's an academic, that'll change. Um, but thank you, Nate. I think everyone will agree with me that that was just sensational and I promise you that's up to the stage.